Lady Mary Wortley Montagues, written the first year I was married. Well, first, the poem, as far as its form, is written in rhymed couplets. And perhaps the most important thing to remember about this poem is that it was written at a time when women were only beginning to write. Uh, Montague is chiefly remembered for her letters, particularly the letters she wrote uh, on a trip to uh, Turkey. Uh, and those letters have been described by Billy Melman as the very first example of a secular work by a woman. So, with regard to um, us remembering that the poem was written at a time when women were just beginning to write, I, I think it's important to read this poem in terms of that and uh, get in our heads an idea of what life was like for women at that time. And while we think about that, you, if you decide to write a paper on this poem or a group of poems, you can think about how uh, this would fit in with some other poems, perhaps written uh, in, in a more modern time. So, for women, women had very limited choices about what they would do with their lives at, at the time Montague wrote this poem. For instance, um, we can think about the works of Jane Austen. Perhaps some of you have seen uh, the movie Pride and Prejudice or some of the other uh, movies that were made from Jane Austen's books, or, and perhaps, hopefully, you've read some of Jane Austen's books. But if we think about the works of Jane Austen, whether it's the book or the movie, they all have the commonality of there's a family uh, that has a number of children, and a number of them are daughters, and they're all of about marriageable age. And then the main plot of the story centers around a daughter or some daughters uh, finding um, a husband and being married off, uh, to, to put it quite frankly. And why that was so important at that time is, again, women had limited choices. They weren't going to go out and become doctors. They weren't going to become lawyers. They didn't have that choice. They were basically going to uh, become wives and mothers, and particularly in, in high society. And Lady Mary Wortley Montague was certainly in high society. There's something called primogeniture. So let's think about that word and break it down. Geniture genealogy, one's family, um, primo, first. And so what primogeniture means is it was really a system in England at that time where the first in the family, primogeniture, the firstborn male child got everything when the father died. Um, and I mean everything. The, he took all the wealth, uh, the family home, and this is why uh, we have in England homes that uh, go back in the family history sometimes for centuries because at that time the firstborn male child got everything so if a family had let's say three sons and four daughters when the father passed away that firstborn male child got everything it was just expected that his brothers would go out and make their own way in the world uh, they they got no money unless you know the firstborn male a uh, child decided to give them something. It happened, but it wasn't all that common, and it wasn't really expected. As far as the daughters, it then became very important, like in Austin's books, to let them have suitors and find husbands, because otherwise that firstborn male child would be perhaps responsible for taking care of them. Not always. He was under no obligation to do so. So if, the, if he had four sisters, three of them were married off, and one never really found a husband, uh, she could just be out on her own with, with very little in the way of choices or opportunities. Now, that, that son that inherited everything, he would have been well thought of in society circles for taking care of the sister that never got married and probably uh, a lot of times that would happen but he was under no obligation to do so so we have to think about the powerless position of women at that time when reading this poem so in terms of this poem now I'm going to read it because it's very short while thirst of power and desire of fame in every age is every woman's aim, of beauty vain, of silly toasters proud, fond of a train, and happy in a crowd. On every fop bestowing a kind glance, each conquest owing to some loose advance, affect to fly, 
in hopes to be pursued, and think they're virtuous, if not grossly lewd. Let this sure maxim be my virtue's guide. In part to blame she is, who has been tried. Too near he has approached, who is denied. All right, the language is certainly old and rather flowery, so let's see what sense we can make of this by looking at each line, each couplet. While thirst of power and desire of fame in every age is every woman's aim. Well, thirst of power and, and, and fame is desired in every age by a woman? In terms of what? Um, I'm not particularly sure about the reading I have of this, but power perhaps in terms of a woman being in a position of power in society at societal get-togethers, parties, and events where she would be in a position of power if she had many suitors uh, trying to woo her as a potential uh, wife. That would be a position of power and then she would in turn uh, be famous within that community as someone who is desirable, who um, other men were pursuing. If we look at the next couplet, of beauty vain and silly toasters proud, fond of a train and happy in a crowd. Okay, of beauty vain, well, to acknowledge one's own beauty is vanity. Of silly toasters proud, a toast when you have a drink and you clink glasses with someone, uh, you you make a toast. So we have to have this image of people well dressed in a society setting, perhaps a ball of some sort, and their people are having some drinks and they're toasting, and they're very silly. All these toasts, so silly toasters, and there's a certain pride that goes along with that, which is also silly. Fond of a train. Well, not a train as a form of transportation, but a train on the back of a woman's dress, like a, like a wedding gown. Uh, we'll often have a train uh, on the back of it as the bride comes down the aisle. So these would be women who are actually fond of dressing like that, fond of being in society and having a train. And they are happy in a crowd. And then we move to the next couplet. On every fop bestowing a kind glance, each conquest owing to some loose advance. A fop is um, a word that is not used so much anymore, but it would be sort of like a gentleman. Uh, we, we might think of uh, an old uh, English film, uh, drawing room drama sort of thing, where um, you would have a, a man who maybe is not considered a manly man by today's standards, like an action hero, very well dressed, uh, perhaps a handkerchief tucked into you know his his sleeve here, which he would take out at times, uh, perhaps a box of snuff, sniffing tobacco. Uh, that would be a, a, a fop. And these societal events would be filled with these type of men uh, bestowing kind glances upon uh, the women. And so that would be an advance, uh, 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 like a, a loose advance uh, uh, upon uh, the woman. Uh, we've heard the expression, uh, you know, he made advances on her or something like that. And then we have effect to fly in hopes to be pursued and think they're virtuous, if not grossly lewd. So effect to fly, well, the effect of all of this attention on the woman perhaps makes her uh, ego uh, take flight that she's she's being uh, pursued because we are even told in hopes of being pursued so uh, anticipation takes flight oh maybe he likes me um, and perhaps these men are not uh, virtuous but given some of the remarks that might be made maybe they're rather lewd and then we move to the final three lines let this sure maxim a maxim is a rule be my virtue's guide. In part to blame she is, who has been tried. Too near he has approached, who is denied. So at this time, a woman's reputation was everything. Once it was compromised, then other gentlemen uh, in that society, they would not be well thought of or accepted in society if they were to woo to court a woman who had a reputation that was somewhat dicey or, or compromised. So the speaker in this poem says, here's my rule, my maxim, 
uh, as a guide to my virtue, so my reputation stays intact. In part to blame she is who has been tried. Any woman who's even received advances, she's saying, um, been tried, received advances, is in part to blame because any man who she has to fend off and deny, even verbally, then he's approached too near to her and to her reputation. Think about that. How different is that from today's standards? Uh, thankfully, it, it's light years different from today's standards. But I do hope this analysis hopes, uh, helps excuse me, in your reading of the poem. Thank you.